Hello, and thank you for joining us on Giving Voice to Depression. I'm Bridget. And I'm Terry. More than 350 million people worldwide suffer from depression, but you do not have to have it yourself to be affected by it. Its prevalence pretty much guarantees that someone you care about battles its darkness. This podcast tries to shine some light into that darkness. We're not experts and we're not therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and are committed to encouraging healthy, healing conversations about mental illness. Episodes in this season are made possible by a grant from the Charles E. Kubley Foundation, which is dedicated to bettering the lives of those affected by depression. We are solely responsible for podcast content. Hi, Terry. Hello, Bridget. It seems like it's been a while since we listed the symptoms of depression. So before we share our guest story today, let's quickly run through them. Okay. According to the DSM-5, which is the manual that doctors use to diagnose mental disorders, you have depression when you have five or more of these symptoms for at least two weeks. Okay. A depressed mood during most of the day, especially in the morning. You feel tired or have a lack of energy almost every day. You feel worthless or guilty almost every day. You have a hard time focusing, remembering details, and making decisions. You can't sleep or you sleep too much almost every day. You have almost no interest or pleasure in many activities nearly every day. You think often about death or suicide, not just the fear of death. You feel restless or slowed down. You've lost or gained weight. According, again, to the DSM-5, you may also feel irritable and restless. Lose pleasure in life. Overeat or stop feeling hungry. Have aches and pains, headaches, cramps, or digestive problems that don't go away or don't get any better with treatment. Mm -hmm. And have that sad, anxious, or empty feeling. Mm, Yep. While these symptoms are common... Not everyone with depression will have the same ones. How severe they are, how often they happen, how long they last can vary, as do symptoms and experiences of any illness. Any illness. One of the main problems of not talking about depression is that neither we nor our family or friends are likely to recognize those symptoms. And that means, well, a whole lot of things, including that we can needlessly endure years and years of struggling or shame or worse when just naming depression and accepting it as one of the many illnesses our bodies can contract would allow us to go to a doctor, see a therapist or a school counselor and say, I don't feel right, which is the start of recovery. Exactly. I need help. I need help. Today's guest is Alexandria Brown. She is author of You, Me, and Depression, A Battle of Heart and Mind. We hunted her down in Canada after reading a few of her essays. Here's Alex, giving her voice to depression. Alex Brown, like most of us, was uninformed and therefore unprepared for a relationship with depression. My depression started out as anxiety, mostly. Um, As a kid, teenager, I was always pretty angry. (laughs) Um, I'm sure my parents weren't exactly sure what was going on, and and I don't think I was either. And so I drank a lot, and I hung out with the wrong people, and I did all of those kind of cliche acting out things that you do as a teenager um, while also battling something that I didn't realize was happening to me. Um, And also back when I was in high school, depression and anxiety, mental health in general, wasn't actually talked about. I think if I had known these things back then, I would have been able to easily identify it better. That's one of the side effects of stigma that's really infuriating. At the risk of making some uncomfortable, think about this. What if all of the things that happen or could happen to our bodies were unmentioned and therefore unanticipated? What would a girl think when, for instance, she got her first period? She'd think something was really wrong, that she was really, really sick, maybe even dying. She'd be afraid. But we are taught about and prepared for that possible life experience and cancer, heart attacks, diabetes, and a lot of other illnesses. But mental illness? Not so much. And that has painful personal consequences. 
I had some issues through college as well. Um, and then I uh, started getting into really dark places, not feeling like myself, not happy at all. Um, it like affected me so much that I didn't want to graduate. I didn't want to do my degree anymore. Um, and so I just thought that I was regular, like not that having depression isn't regular, but I just thought, I was like, okay, this is what life is. I've been a writer for now for about four or five years and my pieces just started getting darker and darker. Um, and they were my feelings and accurate feelings. And I was just like, what is going on here? Um, so I actually had a breakdown in Scotland, um, with my parents. Uh, it was a very random event. I just started crying on the sidewalk and there was nothing that happened. And then I was like, okay, there's something really wrong here. And so from suffering from anxiety for so long that I had, like that I had been, uh, without ever dealing with it, um, I was told through doctors, counselors, that that anxiety has broken me down so much that it's put me into a depressive state. Um, so I've been dealing with depression now because now I can accurately define what's happening when it's happening to me. How does it help to know what it is? Um, I think recognizing what it is um, and knowing that I'm not just a really sad person who looks for negativities in life or, or angry for no reason, um, it helps me kind of understand what I'm going through and gives myself that compassion that I would give someone else. I think because I'm so, I was so hard on myself and, and trying to feel normal and trying to fit in and, and trying to do all these things that when I have those days or when my depression starts to get really bad, I know that I need to either talk to my counselor because I have a counselor that I've been working with for two years now and she's amazing. And, um, as well as either going to talk to my doctor about my dosage because I am on antidepressants. And so they do keep me um, regular uh, with my moods. But life happens. Deaths, divorces, unemployment, all those stressful experiences and lots of others impact us physically and emotionally. It's being able to define what's just a really rough patch in my life and what's actually a deeper problem with my depression. And I think understanding my depression better and understanding that it's a piece of me um, has allowed me to understand that when life gets really hard, it's not actually fully my depression, but I also know that I react differently to situations because of my depression. So I think it's just hmm. more so giving myself compassion and trying to work through and, and finding like those things in my toolkit that work for me to get me out of a really dark place. And you've mentioned both antidepressants and therapy. Uh, what mm -hmm. else is in your toolkit? My parents. Mm, lucky. <laughs> um, I am very lucky. Um, I have my brother and sister-in-law who are also incredibly amazing. And um, I have a really close knit a group of girlfriends as well as guy friends. And then I also, I got a dog. I didn't realize taking care of something else other than myself would actually make me take care of myself because hmm. I have to feed him. I have to walk him. I have to do these things for him. And so pet therapy definitely has been a big one for me because even when I'm having an anxiety attack, he comes over and he just wants pets. And mm -hmm. I think it just takes me out of that like anxiety hold and allows me to just be there and be in the moment and realize, like kind of come back to more of reality and into the moment. Alex didn't used to talk this freely about her experience, but then she realized she couldn't say goodbye to her depression. So she made the choice to say goodbye to hiding it. Here's Alex reading from two of her articles. The person I am now can tell you that the best decision I've made is admitting that I wasn't okay. So I'm saying goodbye to the person I was before and embrace the new one I am now. The girl who has depression but is fully accepting this piece of her. It's a piece of her she is determined to not let win and damn does that feel good. 
It also feels good to know there are other people who get it, who've been in that same dark pit. But there's a really weird thing that happens once in a while when I share my story. I meet other people feeling the exact same way. I meet people who feel guilty that depression makes things feel 100 times worse than they actually are. I meet people who feel as though while there really isn't anything wrong in their life, they just can't seem to be happy. That's the thing about depression. There's no real reason to it, to have it. You just do. So I get through the bad days trying to remember that even though my brain is telling me I'm broken or that there's something wrong with me, there really isn't. I have a little bit of a harder battle than some, but it's a little easier of a battle than others. You can't compare your struggles to anyone. You can't let your mental illness tell you you're worthless. You need to find the inner strength you found this far and pull from it when the days get tough. Not broken. Just a little harder battle than some, but a little easier than others. It's a good reminder that there's a spectrum of human emotions and experiences, and we're all on it. You can't really lump everyone together with depression. We're all different, and we all feel it differently. And and I think that's where some of the misunderstanding comes from with mental health. It's like, well, well, my mom had depression and she couldn't get out of bed for days. And it's like, well, my depression actually gives me insomnia, so I'm up all the time. And our own can vary, right, from from bout, if we want to call it that, to bout or from year to year. You know, mm-hmm. I've, I've had years where I've gotten along just fine with or without an antidepressant, and I've had weeks where I had a real struggle getting out of bed, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Everything, it, it, it changes constantly. Mm-hmm. I think it changes with you uh, as we go through life because our lives are not the same year to year. So it'd be kind of, I guess, foolish to think our depression would stay the same too. Alex describes depression as the hardest opponent you will ever face because it just doesn't give up, ever. And because depression is invisible, Alex writes... Quote, you're sick in a way that makes it easy to judge. You're sick in a way that makes you look lazy and unmotivated. You're sick in a way that makes people think asking, but why can't you just be happy, is a reasonable question. Like, this is all some choice. I've lost people to cancer, and I've also lost people to depression, so I don't really know why they don't hold the same weight. Do you think that people fear if they listen to your story about and understand your mental health struggle that maybe they'll have to acknowledge their own? Yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. I've actually had this conversation with a few people. Um, I think a lot of people have mental health issues, but they don't want to deal with it, and they don't want to talk about it because in some form they think they look weaker. I think that's just a really sad thing, and I really wish that people, even though it's scary, would listen to other stories and then relate to them. And so I think definitely it's a scary thing for people to understand your struggle because it might force them to look at their own and and not a lot of people like to look inside. I know I didn't, (laughs) that's for sure. Of course, the other side of wanting people to recognize depression as an illness is that those of us with it have to, too. We have to be on the lookout for those symptoms that we listed, get a diagnosis and seek treatment if we experience them just like we would if we came down with anything else. That might include calling in sick, taking the occasional mental health day. I mean, sick is sick. The brain is a part of our physical body, even if the world seems to treat it otherwise. And I think that's the thing when we have depression or anxiety, we're trying to do a big fix instead of looking at little things that can just help us get through the day. And I think focusing on those little things are so important because, I mean, just petting my dog or getting a fancier coffee than I usually do or texting my friends, those things seem so little, but they actually help me a lot. And so, I mean, when you're in a dark place, it it is hard to get out of, and I, I definitely understand that. But I just want people to know that, like, they are loved, even if they don't feel like it, and that there is a reason 
to stay in this world and nobody can replace who you are. Hmm. Terry, again and again, I am so struck by how things start to improve once the darkness is revealed. You know, those the wisdom of her tears and the, you know, great fortune of being with parents who were in a position to listen and help. Mm-hmm. That's that's how it starts, you know, and it, it feels like such a big chasm to pull the curtain back and reveal it, but that's the only way that it starts to thin a little bit. And as she said, when she did that, you know, she not only got the help she needed, um, but when she eventually started sharing her story, she heard a lot of other people saying, you know, that they had similar experiences. And, um, you know, as we often say, it can be healing for the person who speaks because it um, takes well, the charge away, takes the stigma away, takes some of the power away from it. Um, and certainly for the people listening, because you're like, oh, it's not just me. Right. And in a weird way that I never, ever would have believed, um, it, it empowered me, too. You know, I mean, just the, it didn't just get me help. Mm-hmm. It it made it I, I don't even really like the word a story because it seems somehow trite. But, you know, the fact that I was able to share my story made the weight of that. I don't know. It empowered me to do it. Mm hmm which was so much more, you know, I was afraid to just do it, period, to anybody, let alone publicly, and to have it be um, an empowering experience when it was something I feared so much is is um, probably true of lots of really important things in life, but mm, powerful, powerful. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. don't get me started on pet therapy. Yeah. <laughs> mm, I love my babies. You do love your babies. Oh, they're so, oh. They're so core to my self-care. I get it. They're, they're actually on, you know, right up there near the top on the lists of protective factors. You know, they really do make a difference for people who Absolutely. love them. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, so we will be back next week with what will be the wrap-up of Season 6, and that's when we give a little sample of some of the parts of the episode that impacted us the most or that we learned the most from. Right. Right. And come check us out on our Facebook page um, and on Twitter. And to get to the Facebook page, all you have to do when you're on Facebook is search for Giving Voice to Depression. On Twitter, we're at Voice Depression. And we're on a lot of other things, too. So just just put it, just, just search it in the Google engine and you'll find us. We will also be linking to Alexandria's website so you can see more of her essays and articles if you're interested in reading them because we found them very helpful. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. And thank you, Bridgie. Bye, Terry. Bye, Hen. We hope that these shared stories bring out a little more understanding or help people articulate their experiences of depression a little more clearly or more freely. Thanks to all, everyone who's digging deep and finding the words and finding the courage to give voice to depression. You can find all the other episodes, some resources, and a blog on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And you can find the podcast most of the other places that you find podcasts. Just Google it, as our mom says. And please remember, if you're hurting, speak up. If someone else is hurting, listen up.